hapa hapa zulia jekundu la vi The votes in the tight Nigerian presidential election are still being counted. We'll have a live update from Lagos. Opposition candidates in Senegal call on their supporters to mobilize following Sunday's vote. And the World Health Organization urges pregnant women exposed to Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo to get vaccinated. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. As the votes are being tallied in Nigeria's presidential election, initial results released by the Independent National Electoral Commission show President Muhammadu Buhari leading the tie race over Atiku Abubakar with victories in 10 of Nigeria's 36 states. Ainek revealed that Abubakar had won seven states and the capital of Buja, which is not a state but is treated as a separate electoral district. Results released Monday by INEC showed Buhari winning the state of Ekiti with about 57% of the vote. Buhari also won a tight race in the state of Osun, defeating his main challenger, Abubakar, by a margin of about 10,000 votes. The voting took place Saturday in all of Nigeria's 36 states and the federal capital territory, although INEC postponed the polls in some areas where voting was disrupted. Now, during the campaign, Buhari's All Progressives Congress and the main opposition People's Democratic Party accused each other of attempting to fix the outcome. At least 47 people have been killed since Saturday in election-related violence, according to the Situation Room, a monitoring organization linking various civic groups. Well, for the latest on the Nigerian election, VOA Peter Clote joins me live from Lagos. Peter, uh, now, besides the results from uh, Ikiti and Osun, where are we definitively getting some kind of results that give us a sense of uh, who is, uh, the extent to which Buhari is leading? Well, yes, indeed, from all the results so far collated by the Independent National and Electoral Commission, incumbent President Mohamed Buhari is leading uh, with a slight margin. Now, the conventional wisdom is that because Kanu and Lagos State are the two most popular states in the whole federation, Kano being the first and Lagos being the second, any candidate, presidential candidate, that wins these two major states automatically wins the presidential election. Now, President Mohamed Buhari, uh, with regards to the collated results, has won Kano and that of Lagos. So it remains to be seen if President, uh, in former Vice President Atiku Abubakar can launch a comeback significant enough to wrestle power from the incumbent president. But already the opposition is saying these results are fixed. What are their grounds for such a claim? Well, the cited instances like in the state of Imo, where the resident electoral commissioner was put under duress, they allege that the daughter of the resident electoral commissioner was kidnapped, and then which forced the electoral commissioner there in the state to read already prepared results. Now, this they cited as an indication of the stronghold of the main opposition PDP to undermine its strength in Imo state, an Igbo-dominated area. A second thing was that um, in all the strongholds of the PDP, they allege uh, there were violence where voters were chased out of the polling stations, some of them were beaten, others were killed and all that. So they cited these instances of violence and then they also cited instances of underage voting up north as mm -hmm. instances that the electoral commissioner has to pay attention to, failure of which they said undermines the integrity of the election in its entirety. Sadly, we're also reporting of deaths during this election period the government had assured the citizens and the world that nobody's going to die uh, what is the reaction from the government at the moment 
Well, the government is saying that security has significantly been improved. Uh, you know, police and the military have been deployed to maintain the peace in a lot of these states. Particularly here in Lagos, there were a few disturbances in Ekorodu, a business district here where Igbo uh, business shops were closed. Uh, however, the police were deployed quickly to calm down tensions from, to prevent uh, an escalation of violence or clashes between the so-called area boys who prevented them from opening their shops and the business people. So these are some of the happenings going on. Uh, calm has returned here in Lagos yeah. and particularly parts of the country so far. Well, Peter, excellent reporting and make sure you come back in one piece. Yeah? Take care. All right. Out. That's a VOA's Peter Closer reporting live from Lagos. Not too far from there, Senegal's Electoral Commission continues to urge presidential candidates and other supporters to avoid making premature declarations about the outcome of Sunday's vote. The call came after Senegal's Prime Minister claimed that the party's unofficial results showed incumbent President Macky Sall had won re-election. However, that declaration was rejected by two opposition candidates, Osman Sonko and Idris Sack who asserted the vote would go to a runoff. Senegal's Electoral Commission says the poll went generally well nationwide and abroad, adding that vote counting continues and results are being colle uh, collected by authorized structures. Official results are expected by Friday. To the south of the continent, albinos in Malawi are asking the government to declare the country unsafe for those with a genetic condition and to help them seek asylum in other countries. Malawi's Albino Association says their continued killings of albinos over the false belief that their body parts are magic is making life too dangerous. In the past month alone, three albinos have been attacked, including a 14-year-old boy who was abducted. Lamek Masina reports. Mese Maulidi's 14-year-old boy, Goodson, was abducted the early morning of February 12 by armed thugs. They forced their way into her house, claiming to be inspectors of the forestry department. They came with flashlights and wore helmets. I couldn't recognize their faces because they were looking down. They immediately grabbed my child while he was sleeping and covered his mouth so he couldn't scream. Maulidi grabbed her 10-year-old daughter, Faith, also albino, and ran screaming for help, but armed with knives, the thugs hacked anyone who tried to rescue the boy. They switched off their flashlights and one of them aimed his machete at my head. But when I tried to avoid it, the knife landed on my cheek. Police arrested three suspects, including the boy's stepfather. Albinos are killed and dismembered in Malawi because of the false belief that their body parts bring good luck and worth. Malau's Abaino Association says authorities have failed to protect them and it's time they help Abainos move to other safer countries. We have lost trust in anyone, even our close friends, even people we are staying with because most of the attacks are arranged by those you live with or even friends. The United Nations has warned if attacks continue, Malau's 15,000 Abainos could one day be wiped out. Malau's authorities acknowledge the problem but say encouraging the albinos to leave the country is not the answer. How do we change those mindsets? It's very, very difficult, but I believe the police are doing the best that they can. But Malau's albinos and their supporters are losing faith in authorities. Last year in southern Malawi, a doctor were charged with the killing a 22-year-old albino man, as police continue to search for her son, Maulidi fears the worst for the fate of her 14-year-old boy and also for her daughter. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Deza. With South Africa's struggling power utility, ESCOM has implemented rolling power cuts to offset heavy debt and management problems. The four-hour cuts, which uh, the state-run utility began this month, have triggered major complaints from residents on the highest levels of government. But the effects are also being felt in the most unexpected places. Viewers Anita Powell reports from Johannesburg. 
South Africa's power utility, Eskom, says recent power cuts, known as load shedding, are required because it is buried in debt. The lack of energy is tiresome for the living, but it's also causing trouble for the dead. Ooh, and load shedding is affecting us a lot. My especially, we undertakers, because you know what? We've got some cops in our fridges and then, but like enough, we've got some backups, but you know what? Uh, we are not, we don't have much enough money for the generator, whatever, to start some generator, because we are always depending on the ESCOM. South Africa's finance minister is attempting to revive the utility with a multi-billion dollar three-year cash infusion. We are setting aside 23 billion rand a year to financially support ESCOM during its reconfiguration. Top officials like Moeni have criticized Soweto and other townships for not paying their power bills. But the real cost is the economic loss from power cuts, about $143 million per day, says analyst Chris Yelland, and Eskom's blown budgets. Deep problems financially, deep problems operationally, and uh, simply a non-compliance uh, environmentally. Uh, and the solutions, of course, uh, are complex, uh, going to take a lot of money. Eskom has considered raising prices, but would face a public backlash. Resident Mapule Noko says power costs are already too high, and she understands why her neighbors refuse to pay. They're not paying for electricity. They are unemployed. I don't blame them, I don't judge them, but I know I'm from Soweto, I know they are not working. So they have to come up with a plan, create jobs, maybe the electricity will be paid for, or something, I don't know. Undertaker Rametsi is likewise at a loss for how to resurrect the utility. But his main concern these days is making sure South Africans rest in peace when the lights go out. Anita Powell, VOA News, Johannesburg. Well, Kenya's ride-hailing company, Little Cab, is expanding to Tanzania and Ghana. The company will begin offering rides in Tanzania's commercial cabs to Dar es Salaam next week and plans to launch in Accra by May. Here's viewers Maria Matiala. Little Cab, which competes with global players such as Uber and Taxify in Kenya, says it's expanding its ride-sharing business to Tanzania and Ghana. The company's CEO says the business plans to raise about $50 million more in capital in the coming months. We are meeting a couple of investors both uh, in, on the continent and in the Silicon Valley. and uh, The interest is there. We are just trying to figure out. Uh, we are hoping that it will. the in investment should close in the course of like later mid of this year. The company is valued at about $75 million and without the deep pockets of its ride hailing competitors in the region, Kamal Budabati says Little Cab has been attracting drivers by encouraging them to offer extra services to earn money. Our drivers are agents, they can sell insurance for you, they can sell airtime, they can pay light water bills, they can do all those little, little things around that, that increases their income. So then, if you are doing that, then you don't actually start fighting right, just on the price uh, war that's happening at the moment. The two-and-a-half-year-old company has 10,000 drivers in Nairobi and over a million users on its platform. Last month, it launched a bus service as well. I think the middle-income uh, consumer, middle and the above, is what we feel that we are targeting. But you see, that's where also we come into the place because we also have a product for Boda Boda, which is two-wheelers. And uh, we also have a product for Shuttle, which is like a mass transit platform. So if you look at it, for us, consumer, uh, because of the spread is, is bigger, any consumer who needs transport somewhere down the line fit in any some of our products. Little Cab is available in Kenya for a segment of the market that doesn't have smartphones. The company worked with mobile operators and introduced a short code which allows it to identify a passenger's location and provide a ride. Mariama Jalu, VOA News. We we'll want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We also stream our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Still ahead on Africa 54, urging pregnant women in the Democratic Republic of Congo to get the Ebola vaccine. We'll be right back.
Voices, we're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Time for our health report. Uh, joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu with some good advice for pregnant women. Lino. And that's right, Vincent. An independent advisory body convened by the World Health Organization recommends pregnant women and breastfeeding women in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo be vaccinated against the deadly Ebola virus. On the basis of accumulated evidence, the group of immunization experts recommends continued ring vaccinations for Ebola in DRC. Ring vaccination is a strategy that prevents the spread of the disease by vaccinating only those those likely to be infected with the virus. The experts advise pregnant women at high risk of infection and death from Ebola should be given the vaccination in their second or third trimester, as should breastfeeding women and babies under age one. The WHO says all vaccinated pregnant women will be closely monitored until the birth of their babies to see if there are any adverse effects. The latest WHO figures put the number of Ebola cases in the DRC at 853, including 521 deaths since the beginning of the outbreak in August. So far, more than 800,000 people have been vaccinated against Ebola in the DRC. The United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross in a joint appeal say violence and conflict and the stigma that victims often face must be addressed immediately. Peter Maurer, the president of the Red Cross, warns the world is facing a grave protection failure amid rising sexual violence in conflict area. In an appeal for $27 million to fund a better response to the issue in 14 countries, Maurer describes the lasting damage caused by sexual and gender-based violence, which is used as a tactic of war to dehumanize victims and destabilize communities. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says one way to tackle the prevalence of such violence is to promote for gender equality. The UN says, among other things, it will promote women's participation in conflict prevention and resolution. The world is growing ever more aware of the ubiquity of conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence. We must do everything in our power to end the horror and stigma that affects hundreds of thousands of women and girls, as well as men and boys, worldwide. If we want to address the problems of violence, sexual violence against women and girls, and indirectly with also a positive impact on sexual violence against men and boys, it's absolutely essential to look into the questions of power in our societies. And maybe you call it feminism. I consider that the most important reform I'm making in the United Nations is to make sure that we have gender parity at all levels of the organization. We are asking states to restate their commitment to international humanitarian law. The law is clear. Rape and other forms of sexual violence are violations. The Geneva Conventions made this prohibition clear and universal, and yet, 70 years on, we continue to face failures of behavior and accountability. We work with the survivors of horrific acts, including with women and girls given as rewards in war, fathers whose sons have been abducted and raped, young women fleeing disaster and conflict only to be sexually enslaved, and with detainees when sexual atrocities are wielded as means of torture. Following the joint appeal in Geneva, the United Nations and the Red Cross are pledging to listen to survivors and victims of these crimes to enable their voices to be heard and to support them through local organizations, particularly women's organizations in conflict zones. 
Now, the winner in Nigeria's presidential election will face a disturbing challenge, how to help the millions of children suffering from malnutrition. While hunger as a whole is gradually declining in Nigeria, the rate of acute malnutrition and stunted growth has seen little or no improvement. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. Samaila Shinguri and his wife's two-year-old triplets are not well. Shinguri says the couple could not afford to feed them properly as babies, and now they're suffering from malnutrition. We are begging the government to help us because we don't have money to even buy food. We are begging the government. The United Nations Children's Fund says child hunger in Nigeria is declining by about 3% per year. But the rate of severe acute malnutrition, a technical term for starvation, remains the same. The UN says two and a half million Nigerian children are starving and only one in five of them get help. Nigeria's health ministry distributes food and treatment, but admits it's not enough. It's really a serious issue of public health concern. Our malnutrition has been on the rise. Yes, over 900,000 children die annually. Widespread poverty, insecurity in the north, and poor health care are fueling child malnutrition. Medical experts like Dr. Adeyemi Adenirong are trying to show Nigerians how to give children a better start in life. From the point of birth, the baby is being introduced to breastfeeding, and that is the cheapest and the best. But the advocacy and the awareness about this has been a bit poor. We're also bringing that on board now to encourage mothers to make sure they breastfeed exclusively for six months. But better health care only goes so far in alleviating widespread poverty. Whoever is elected as Nigeria's new leader on Saturday faces the challenge of improving the economy so more Nigerian children can live long and healthy lives. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenor Mudu. Vincent, back to you. Well, thanks a lot, Lenor. Be sure to watch Lenor Mudu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. U.S. President Donald Trump arrived in Hanoi, Vietnam on Tuesday night for summit talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The two leaders are to hold meetings Wednesday in the Vietnamese capital on a range of issues, most importantly the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Viewers Bill Gallo has more from Hanoi. Now, Kim Jong-un arrived here earlier today. He arrived at the Malia Hotel in the Old Quarter, which is where he's staying for the week. He was greeted by throngs of cheering crowds. He was very happy and pleased with himself. He was smiling, waving to the crowds. It was really quite a scene here on the streets of Hanoi. But perhaps the more interesting thing is what Kim Jong-un will say over the next two days. Of course, South Korean and U.S. officials claim he is ready to take a significant step to start giving up his nuclear weapons, but that is perhaps further than what Kim Jong-un himself has actually said to this point. He will have an opportunity this week in Hanoi to say much more. Bill Gallo, VOA News, Hanoi. Well, as President Trump and Kim Jong-un prepare to meet in Vietnam, residents um, in the South Korean capital share their expectations. VOA's Steve Miller reports from Seoul. Preparations are underway in Hanoi, Vietnam for the second U.S.-North Korea summit. U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un begin meeting Wednesday evening to discuss moving forward on the agreement they made in June last year in Singapore to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Speaking in the Oval Office last week, President Trump was optimistic about the upcoming meeting. I think next week's going to be very exciting. It's going to be the second summit. I think a lot can come from it. Uh, at least I hope so, the denuclearization ultimately. With the outcome of the summit directly affecting life on the peninsula, Seoul residents had a lot to say about the upcoming meeting. Longtime Seoul resident and Korean-American William Cho was not sure what might materialize from the Hanoi summit, but had a generally positive view. Uh, 
I don't think that it has to be denuclearization, but he does have to provide something to um, get the UN sanctions relief and the, the congressional sanctions relief that he needs. Uh, so he has to do something. Uh, I think some people think that he will never do it, but I think uh, he, sh uh, he has a lot to gain. And why would he want to keep on to the nukes? At a summit protest site, Freedom Union spokesman Kim Sung-jin chastised North Korea's past provocations against the South, believing there's been little change in Pyongyang for 70 years. I think it is necessary to have North Korea's complete denuclearization. Nuclear weapons, warheads, launchers and technicians must be revealed, and the denuclearization measures must be completed. Keep the principle, rather than compromising, is required. Kim Un suk told VOA the discussions were good, but tempered her outlook on denuclearization and unification. The two leaders meeting at the summit doesn't really matter, but it is too early to expect something because North Korea is not yet ready, and neither is South Korea. That means, for the time being, South and North are still suspicious of each other. Trump and Kim meet in Hanoi for their second summit, February 27th and 28th. Steve Miller, VOA News, Seoul. But here's what's trending. The stars of the silver screen hit the red carpet in Los Angeles on Sunday night for the 91st Academy Awards. But many looks left viewers scratching their heads. Bright colors, especially shades of pink, were on trend, as were big, floated dresses and gigantic, freely shoulder accents. Now, meanwhile, the men chose to reef on the traditional tuxedo themes with splashes of color and unusual cuts making an appearance. Green Box, the period drama about race relations in the 1960s, won Best Picture at the Oscars, marking the final twist on a night of historic first and diversity, while Black Panther, which earned several technical awards. What I up at the beginning of the 1970s, a group of forward-thinking Italian entrepreneurs decided to create a dedicated event, uh, the Eyewear Universe. They call it Mido. This year in Milan, the event featured the top Italian and international players, designers, and other eyewear professionals. The show's gaze is focused on the future of eyewear. Mido also offers unique insights to where global eyewear uh, styles and trends are headed. A walk through its pavilions offers a full immersion experience of futuristic sitting rooms, lead floor, LED floors, and gigantic lenses. Uh, meanwhile, marketers are studying the latest buying trends in China, the U.S., Japan, and Europe. Well, and finally, singing monsters, moving by toys and collectibles, took over Toy Fair in New York, a hinted upcoming trend for 2019. Lego promoted sets for the upcoming Toy Story 4 movie and celebrate the 20th anniversary of its Star Wars line. But the company also pushed new play. His bro used to its space at the fair to focus on old timers. It gave a lift to the iconic Monopoly board game, which now comes in versions in a fashion, in a version aimed at millennials and showcased its play duo and Nerf guns. The hardest trends this year are games that bring people together and connect people in new and different ways. And that's what's trending. And that's our show. Good night.